Great. Cool. All right, thanks. Well, thanks, Simon. Awesome. We'll take it away. So, <clears throat> so basically, this this talk is on. Um, so, so this talk is a follow up talk uh, that I did f from a talk I did five years ago for uh, Santa Cruz JS, which is um, so that was May of two thousand fifteen. And that was uh, in person, you know, back when we could still have human contact. And uh, it was really cool. It was my first time to Santa Cruz. Uh, Albert, who's in this, who's in this uh, room right here, is uh, he connected me to this group. And anyway, it was really awesome. At the time, you know, React was really new, and so it was. Um, uh, so this is us. This is us five years ago at a place. I can't remember the name of this place. I don't know, if, Albert, if you remember what this place was called. Uh, I think it's next uh, Cruzio, no? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it was like a co-working space there, um, and so anyway, that was uh, that was us five years ago. And you know, at the, at the time, React was was really new. It was it was radically different from other frameworks um, in ways that maybe were uh, fairly controversial, right? And and so like what I tried to do five years ago is is convince uh, the audience, convince you guys that that React is is sort of a game changer. And and you know, sort of the statement that I was making was that that it won't just change the way you you build user interfaces, but it'll change the way you think about UI. Right? It'll kind of force you to think declaratively in in ways that maybe were uh, fairly different from the other uh, frameworks of the time. And so uh, since then, uh, a lot of interesting things have happened. And and maybe one of the sort of most obvious ones is that React has kind of become like the de facto standard in front end development. And what, what I mean by that is like if a new startup gets going, uh, chances are they they probably choose React. I mean, you know, they might choose Vue or, or things, but um, you know, if uh, uh, most new libraries come out with at least you know React support, so it, it's kind of become a de facto standard in in certain ways. Um, and and it's probably impacted the career of every JavaScript developer, whether you actually build React or not. So for example, people in this room who, who aren't using uh, React explicitly, you're likely using a framework that has been influenced by React in fundamental like kind of core ways. And what I mean by that is like e even other languages like Swift UI, right? Swift UI was heavily influenced by kind of the component model and the declarative model of React. And so was uh, Vue and in some ways Angular too, right? So so this is me. So we did intros earlier. So I'm Simon. Um, and uh, a lot has happened in five years. So, so this slide here. So this was a photo of myself that I had on the slide five on the slide deck five years ago with with my uh, at the time less than one year old child. And then that's the same kid now. So that's like two weeks ago, um, with our face masks and everything. Um, and so uh, besides that, I have another little one. So this is my uh, other little member of the family. Um, and so uh, a lot of things have, have at least changed in, in my life. Um, but I guess you guys came here to see what has changed in React, right? Like, what has happened in React? And so, kind of what I'd like you guys to take away uh, from this talk, if I look at my notes here, um, essentially, I, I kind of want to reignite some of the excitement that I think uh, you might remember from React five years ago. And, and those of you who are new to React probably don't remember how you know it was, it was a fairly tumultuous but but sort of exciting time for React. And and so I kind of want to talk to you about what is what has changed in the way that we build modern UIs because I think React has kind of fundamentally changed how we how we build UIs. And then um, and, and I want to talk about some of the changes that are upcoming and some of the new things that are happening in in the React space. And my my goal is to convince you that React is still the leader in this space, and that it's still innovating, and it's still fun and exciting, and um, th that it's absolutely the best choice for your front-end projects. Uh, OK, so um, what has this journey been like um, so far, right? Uh, what have we learned? And you know, kind of why is React still number one? Because I think that's important, right? Like frameworks come and frameworks go, and, and it's almost a little bit surprising or unusual. It's a bit of an outlier that React is has uh, maybe gained such a strong foothold for such a long time, right? Um, you know, I don't know how many more years it has to be sort of the most popular framework before it will overtake jQuery, because jQuery is probably like has the crown of all times in terms of, of JavaScript uh, uh, libraries. But anyway, um, I, I would definitely like to uh, jump into also what's new and exciting in React world as well. So I feel like in order to look at how far we've come in the past few years, uh, let's, let's go with me on a journey back to May 2015, so five years ago. And so uh, to give you some context, so you know the Apple Watch had just been released. AirPods don't exist yet. Uh, the first MacBook with USB-C was just announced, which is the 12-inch MacBook. Uh, Windows 10 was not even released. It wasn't even. It didn't even come until later in the summer. Um, Internet Explorer was the number two browser with a, like 10 to 20% market share, depending on how you measure it. And Microsoft Edge didn't even exist, right? So 
Uh, we had a different president. Insta Stories doesn't exist yet in 2015 or in May of 2015, so you have to use Snapchat. Uh, and then there was this thing called like Periscope and Meerkat that were like kind of competing to be the you know like live streaming trend of like streaming from your mobile phone. Uh, California is in a drought, um, and you know human contact is still a thing. Like we can still like interact with other people. Uh, but aside from all that, in actual development world, uh, ES6. If you know a, a lot of these, I, I guess a lot of the slides that I'm going to talk about are, are probably. Um, more geared towards people who've been around in the JavaScript community for a while. So some of these things might seem like totally weird to you. But yeah, so there's this thing called ES6. Uh, at the time, it was still called Harmony. So you had to use the like dash dash Harmony flag on Node if you wanted to use this like modern, crazy new features that we probably take for granted now. Um, we were mostly using Gulp and Browserify because Webpack had like just started to get popular, right? So everybody's using these kind of funky tools to, to uh, build tools. Um, AngularJS is the most popular web framework by like an enormous margin, and, and you'll see some slides on that later. Uh, and then we've got this thing called like CSS and JS now, which didn't even exist back then, um, or you know, it wasn't really a, a thing that people knew of. And the Node.js community, if you remember, this was split into two camps. There was this IOJS, which was a fork of Node, and then there was original Node, and they didn't re-merge into one again um, until several months, until like midway through 2015. Uh, GraphQL was just announced, and React is just starting to gain popularity right, from Facebook. So Facebook's kind of just pumping out open source stuff at this point. Um, and then React Native coming out of Facebook had just been open source like you know, probably uh, like two or three months before, before uh, um, May of 2015, which is uh, the, the time frame that we're transporting into right now. Uh, Flux is this con as a concept, which many of you have probably never heard of, is like really hot, and Redux did not exist yet. And Rust 1.0 was just announced. So that's kind of the, the developer scene at the time, right? And so now that I think about it, like when you list all those things and you kind of look at what happened in 2015, it was a huge year for developers, right? And I don't, I don't just mean because like, you know, the Apple Watch came out, uh, which developers are really excited about building stuff for, or, you know, Windows 10 came out in 2015, but just like all the, the stuff that was in the landscape in 2015. It was a really sort of transformative time um, in, in a positive way, I think, right? And so um, because of that, naturally, everybody's like, JavaScript fatigue, if you remember that term. And, and so it's like, you know, startup tries 365 JavaScript frameworks and, and doesn't like any of them. So, so these are like, I don't know if you remember any of these, like Zepto.js. You know, I, don't, I don't even remember what that is. Um, YUI was a big one, right? Dojo. Some of these things, like this is just like the landscape was scattered with these uh, types of JavaScript frameworks. Um, and so, you know, the, the hype, your end, Ember.js is your antidote to hyper fatigue. You know, this is the stuff that the stuff of conferences at the time, right? So this is kind of uh, uh, everybody competing to kind of gain popularity, and and yet, um, you know, even though it's very fragmented, Angular has a, a, a very very clear advantage, right? If you, if you look in market share, right? But then it was followed by things like Backbone and Ember and Meteor and Knockout, and then React is way down there after Knockout, which is um, a little, maybe a little bit funny because you you look at React and Knockout now, and probably nobody's ever heard of Knockout, right? Um, and it's like, do you remember these things? Do you remember Firefox OS? Do you remember Aure Aurelia? Like, I, I don't, you know, me neither. Um, like, <laughs> I don't know what these things are. Uh, but this is like, and then you can see Vue way down there, just just getting its foothold. So so this was uh, interesting times. And and at the time, we didn't know which one of these was going to come out on top, right? And maybe we assumed it was going to be Angular, but um, but it was, it was quite interesting to to see these ideas compete um, for dominance. So, you know, I, I should also mention that if. Anybody wants to jump in, since this is such a like kind of interactive feeling type presentation, like jump in and, and make some comments and like uh, uh, you know just unmute and say something if you guys have any questions. Does anybody have any questions or anything? I don't have a question, like, but I literally laughed out loud when you said harmony. I had totally forgotten about all that nonsense. I'm like, yes, right? behind their farming. I was just like, really? I remember most of these things, and I can tell you what they were. So yeah. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. I, I just wanted to quickly say, this is Mark Eddington. Um, that was really awesome. Blast from the past. Five years ago, I wasn't really doing much with front end stuff. Um, but all the bullet points on your slides were all relevant to me, and I enjoyed that. So just, just kudos on that. Awesome. Yeah, this whole presentation is going to be a little bit of a blast from the past, but you know, we're going we're gonna to get to some forward-facing stuff too. But yeah, total blast from the past, right? I love it. Um, yeah, so, th so this was our, you know, our ecosystem got really messy for a while, right? So these were the, the build systems. Some of you guys are, some, uh, some of our old timers here are going to remember these. So this is like if you wanted to build something for the web, which I mean, even the concept of like building for the web, people are like, why would you build? You just put JavaScript in the HTML. But, um, but build systems were coming about, and so it was like, 
what are all these things, like sprockets? I don't even remember what sprockets is, but I remember Grunt and Gulp and JSPM, uh, very briefly JSPM. Browserify was huge, right? And then Webpack at the very end there was just starting to get started. So these, this was the ecosystem, right? This is what we dealt with. And so, um, you know, really, React was in its infancy. So, so at this point, React was just kind of a little upstart that that um, you know a handful of companies were using, and everybody was also just like, eh, it comes from Facebook, and eh, I don't know about that, right? Um, but um, as, as we kind of go forward in time, like let's talk about some interesting stuff that has happened in React world since 2015, so in the past five years. And I think this is where probably the bulk of the interesting stuff in, in React space has happened, right? Um, okay, so this is probably a controversial statement, but Redux came and went. Um, you know, not that Redux is doesn't exist anymore, or not that it isn't even uh, that it isn't being used anymore. But you know, Redux kind of has ha has had its heyday, right? So it came out in the uh, tail end of 2015, and it was and it just took the world by storm, and it changed the way everybody was like everybody had to go to Redux because you just had to, right? And it was like, you know, it was like almost mandatory if you're going to put a job post. It was like hiring a React developer must know JavaScript, React, Redux. It was one of those things that just kind of became a de facto. Um, and then it slowly kind of went away as people just got, realized there was a lot of boilerplate involved. It, it solved a, a certain kind of problem really well, um, and it had really good separation of concerns. And then it started to kind of become not as dominant. So now I haven't used a new product, like I haven't started a new project that uses Redux probably in in a year or so, right? Um, and so we should probably talk more about like what that gets replaced with uh, another time. But yeah, um, Flow came and went. Um, Flow was, was a type system for JavaScript that just got smashed by TypeScript. So TypeScript just, just ate its dinner, right? Ate its lunch, as the expression goes. And so, um, and, and Flow came out of Facebook. You win some, you lose some. There's immensely popular uh, frameworks have come out of Facebook, and Flow is not one of them anymore. Um, higher order components sort of really came into the, the React space with a splash, and then sort of also went away. So these are kind of the, the, the journey. Um, and then render props came out as like the savior to higher order. So like all the problems created by higher order components, render props were like, we're going to solve them. And, and they were being pushed by a handful of uh, really innovative people in the community. And, and render props still exist, right? They, uh, you know, I don't want to say they're gone. But um, render props as a pattern has stuck. And so maybe the, the takeaway from all of these technologies as we go through these things is that the, the good parts of Redux, for example, have stuck around, right? Like, re, like the concepts of dispatch and everything have not gone anywhere. Just Redux, the library isn't used as much, right? And the good parts of flow, the, uh, essentially typing and things like that are here to stay. Higher order components, the concepts behind that are here to stay. And so render props is like in the ecosystem now. It was just like a, a thing that has come and gone, uh, that, that, is, that has come, made a splash, and that now is kind of like in the fossil record, so to speak. Um, and so like, I don't know, do you guys remember Thunks and Redux Saga? Um, these were libraries that again still exists. People still use them. Um, I, you know, I don't start new projects with thunks or anything. But um, these were these, these came to solve uh, a problem or, or to uh, provide a solution to things in the e in the Redux ecosystem. So the thing with Redux is it's it's very unfriendly to side effects in in that you you are not meant to do side effects in your reducers and things like that. So in order to you know allow a software to do side effects, because if your software doesn't do side effects, then it's probably useless. Um, uh, we had these patterns of, of ways to introduce side effects in a controlled way, and, and they were really good patterns. Um, but you know, again, the kind of problems that they're solving are, are maybe not problems that, that need solving as much today, at least on the Redux Saga side, right? Um, thunks are probably still used fairly often. Uh, and then you know, this kind of thing that, it, that probably seems so obvious now is Create React App did not exist five years ago, and so uh, somehow in like 2017 or 18 or whatever, uh, somebody came along and was like. Why is it so hard to set up a new React project? Why do I have to configure Babel every time in ESLint and and uh, you know Webpack and all these things? Um, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a command line tool that would just create the project for us? And so um, and and the, the someone who came up with that is is Dan Abramov, who is kind of the father of a lot of the technologies in this in this presentation. And so uh, came along and was like, why don't we just make a command line tool that does exactly that? And so that's um, you know one of those things where you're like, it's not even worth mentioning. Like these things just like. <laughs> It's like table stakes. These are basics, but they didn't exist five years ago, right? So, so the community had to create these things. Um, and then you know, React kicked off this kind of CSS and JS revolution, which um, again came out of Facebook, and it was a super controversial thing at the time. Uh, it, uh, the, the presentation that came out of Facebook, which I think was Christopher Shadow back in, I want to say, like 2015 or 16, was um, basically that why do we need another language? Like, like why do we write everything in JavaScript, and then we have this whole other language which you have to learn, which in some ways is like more complicated or quirky than JavaScript, um, just to do your styling. And they're like, well, why don't we just put our styles in JavaScript? And so um, 
you know, it, it came in again with a big splash. It was like, oh my god, I have to put all my styles in, in JavaScript. Um, and then you know, now we look back at it, we're like, let's be honest. It was really CSS and React. It was like React coming in and saying, I want to do it a certain way, and the rest of the world just kind of like jumped on board because it was hype, right? But, um, but it, it, it made its mark on the industry. And we still, we still do CSS and JavaScript, but, but we don't always have to now, right? Like people still do write CSS using, you know, styled components is a, a good example of writing traditional CSS, wrapping it in a string, and then some magic happens to, to, to compile it into JavaScript. So, um, so anyway, this is like uh, something that has impacted, um, impacted the uh, uh, ecosystem, right? And then the rise of TypeScript. And this is one of the most transformative things that we're probably going to talk about so far. Um, TypeScript has, has changed a lot of, of how we do things. And so um, I think part of it was that the, it was JavaScript needed to grow up. JavaScript needed to mature. And, and we found the flaws in JavaScript. And we fixed some of those flaws with like linting tools. And we fixed other of those flaws with you know, uh, formatting tools and type, you know, type checkers uh, uh, like Flow. And then TypeScript came around and was just like, OK, this is an incremental way to add types to your JavaScript. Um, and even though it's kind of considered a different language by you know, it has a different file extension, it is, it is JavaScript with added stuff. And, and I think that is how any new language becomes successful in the JavaScript ecosystem is by incremental adoption. Um, you know, when languages come along, like you remember Dart. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember Dart, but um, it is now seeing a second coming just because of one particular framework. But Dart came along from Google. Um, from the Chrome team who were like, we're going to replace JavaScript completely because JavaScript has so many flaws, and we're going to replace it with this other language. And it just didn't take off, right? Because JavaScript is incredibly resilient. Um, either we all love JavaScript because maybe that's why it stuck around, or um, we're just kind of addicted to it or we're stuck with it. Um, I don't know. But JavaScript is one of those things that kind of like, uh, as they say, always bet on JavaScript. Um, and so TypeScript made a bet on JavaScript. Like They were like, I bet JavaScript just needs a little bit more typing. And so if you think about it, like ES6 and some of those things also kind of bet on, on JavaScript by just saying, let's incrementally add new, new powerful things. So um, I, you know, in, in some ways, you could say uh, TypeScript has, has really um, taken over the entire JS ecosystem to the point that uh, I would say far more than half, a, a large majority of, of new um, uh, libraries that, that hit NPM are written in TypeScript. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the most uh, transformative things. If you look at the, the journey of TypeScript, you can see that you know, going from 2011, here, here's where you see CoffeeScript was dominant right? Uh, in terms of languages that are, not, that are JavaScript-like, JavaScript-ish languages. Uh, CoffeeScript was huge back then. And then you can see right at the right side of that in 2015, you can see TypeScript started to, to gain popularity. And then just boom, right, uh, off the charts. And, and I put Flow in here for comparison as well. And Flow just, like, like I said, never, never really took off. Facebook wins some, and they did not win this one. Um, and so, you know, TypeScript has. I think Microsoft did an excellent job with with making TypeScript easy to adopt. The tooling is incredible. Um, it's you know backed by a big company, but uh, and and it is opinionated in its own way. But it is uh, adds a lot of value to everybody. And and I will also credit Angular for this. A a Angular's adoption of TypeScript um, kind of you know uh, helped everybody kind of jump on board, right? Uh, and then we had tools like ESLint and Prettier, and and you know, I, we look at what we have now, and we're like, wow, this is excellent tooling. You know, my I I don't have to worry about putting a semicolon in it. Like I never want to in my life see my tests fail because I forgot to put a semicolon or I didn't put enough spaces or tabs. Like, like we look at that and they're like, why, why why did we ever deal with that? Right? Did we ever deal with some you know like the nits in a pull request where somebody's like, oh you know your indentation is wrong? It's like no, we have tooling to do this. Right? We just press save and just magically it solves it, and we never even have to think about it. Um, you know, ESLint still has a place. I think ESLint is has a lot of overlap with Prettier. There are things, stylistic things that, that our linting tools used to solve that um, now don't need to anymore. As well as there are things that ESLint used to solve that TypeScript now solves for us. So, um, but ESLint still has an important place. Like for example, with hooks, if we uh, want to make sure we don't forget dependencies and things like that, ESLint uh, is pretty helpful. So I would say if you look at TypeScript, ESLint, and Prettier, and and what it provides for us, the developer experience um, is enormously better than it was in 2015. Um, like an order of magnitude, right? Uh, and then speaking of developer tools, so uh, this is VS Code, which uh, again from Microsoft, incredible things coming out of, surprisingly incredible things in the open source community coming out of Microsoft um, in the last five years. But this is um, th this editor again has just like taken the world by storm. I, I you know I don't know what people were using prior to this because uh, I think back and I'm like, what was I using? I guess I was using Atom, but sometimes Sublime, and some people were using Vim and this and that, but like. 
this became the kind of one editor that sort of unified everybody. Uh, um, and, and it's just extensible and hackable, and people like to build plugins, and there's a great community around it. So, um, And it's written in TypeScript. So now we edit our TypeScript in an editor written in TypeScript. So um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, other things that kind of came out in the last few years, uh, server-side rendering and static site generators, which you could actually think is a solution to a problem that didn't need solving. Like, like you'd be like, why did we need server-side rendering for React? React shouldn't even be used on the server. Like, who would use React on the server-side? Like, it's a tool for making you know, interactive UIs. Um, but you know, maybe React has this way of just seeping into every corner of our, of our development career. And so somebody was like, no, we need to run. React on the server, so we have to build this static site generator that lets us write the React, runs the React on the server, generates the HTML, and then serves that up. Um, whereas, like prior to that, we've been just like write the HTML then, right? Um, but it's cool. It, it, it unlocks some things that maybe would have been hard to solve previously in terms of like if you want a, a website that's highly interactive or feels like a web app, but you also want it to be search engine friendly, things like that, right? Um, stop me if you guys have any questions. Uh, no question, but uh, about server-side rendering, I think it's pretty. Uh, uh, if you if you're able to do server-side rendering, you can actually you know serve pages, static pages of your uh, of your site. I mean, whatever it's a report or whatever you know. In the past life, we had to generate uh, PDF reports from uh, charts and stuff that the user sets. So that helps to actually. Uh, be able to just use the same code to do both things on the front end and the back end. Yeah, you're right. You know, maybe maybe one of the big benefits of this, you know, because the criticism is like, why run React on the server just to generate HTML? There are better tools to do that with than React. Um, but maybe the argument is is the, in favor of this is is like you said, like let's not write it twice. Like let's not write it all in HTML and then also write it all in React. Let's let's write it once. So. For sure, and and both of these tools here, Gatsby and Next, are really worth looking into. They're they're really powerful, really cool stuff. Hey, also, uh, mm -hmm. uh, not a not a question, but just a comment. Mm -hmm. um, this Mark, um, you you said that uh, the VS Code was written in TypeScript, um, and it uh, for the people who are newer to the ecosystem, I just wanted to mention that uh, TypeScript was actually, I mean, the father of TypeScript is Anders Heisberg, who also wrote Delphi which was a programming language built on Pascal. Um, and the Delphi IDE, which was similar to VS Code before it became a thing, was written in itself as well. So the, the brilliant genius who creates languages like nobody's business is just continuing to do his thing up there in Microsoft. And it's wonderful to watch it happen. And I think he's the father of C Sharp, too. Is that correct? That is absolutely yeah, correct. He, he also made Microsoft Java, I mean C Sharp. I know, got it. Yeah, I'm with you. Microsoft Java, uh, C Sharp. <clears throat> uh, that's right. Or, you know, C Sharp, some people would say, is like Java done right. It's like they took yeah, Java. Uh, it was a privilege of my career to actually get to work side by side with him for a couple of years before he, wow. he moved off to, to, to the great Northwest. So That's incredible. That's awesome. Um, that's cool stuff. Uh, yeah, so so you know other things that have kind of come into the ecosystem or into the language, and and you know this is one example. Async await is one example of kind of all of the newer JavaScript that came after ES6, right? Which if you remember, ES6 was renamed to ES2015, and then we had these incremental every year things, right? So it was remember it was ES3, which came out in like the you know late 90s or early 2000s, and then there was just like nothing for a long time until 2010 came around. We had ES5. They skipped four for historical reasons. There's a whole story around that. Um, there's a committee. It fell apart. Anyway, so ES4 got skipped. Then we had ES5. came out in 2010, uh, or 2009 or 2010. Um, and then so it was like this huge gap. And then there's another five-year gap. And then all of a sudden, we had ES2015. You know, and then people were like, well, well, guys, let's just be more incremental about this. So then every year, we have new stuff. So it, it actually happens so subtly and progressively now that I don't even know what year we got async await. It might be like two, ES2018 or whatever. But like the key point is, we don't really have to think about that, right? We just get these amazing new language features, and we start using them whenever they're available, whenever they're standardized or close to it. And um, and we use our kind of build tools, like like we talked about earlier, uh, Webpack and Babel and stuff. And um, it just magically makes it work 
right? We don't have to think like, how does async await actually get compiled down to normal JavaScript? No, our build tool just allows us to use it. So the reason I mentioned this is because I feel like async await is probably the most transformative of all of the JavaScript features that have come out post 2015. Um, so you know that that just changed it from not just callback stuff and promise stuff to like really writing code that felt um, like writing Python. You know, so, like it just feels synchronous. Like I, I know Python doesn't technically work the same way because they have threads and stuff, but um, you know, it it, it made uh, this kind of weird asynchronous language feel normal again, right? So it was really cool. I did a whole talk on this. Actually, one of my most um, this was like 2017 I did a talk on this, and it turned out to be one of the most watched talks. Like somebody posted online and it got a bunch of, uh, of watches. So I was like, um, at the time, you know, it was like, yeah, you know, here's just a JavaScript feature. But it turned out to be like a, a JavaScript feature that people really wanted and they really liked. So it was a good one. Uh, and then there's this other thing in React world called hooks. And I guess I should ask, like, how many people have used hooks or know what it is? Give me the, give me the thumbs up or something. We got one. Um, Two, three, four. It's um, this is in the same way that like async await is probably the most transformative thing that happened to uh, JavaScript uh, since 2015. This is the most transformative thing that happened to React since then, right? So this has just completely changed how we write React, um, but in in a in a good way. Like there's an upgrade path to it, right? So uh, old React had classes. Like the like to sum it up in one sentence, old React had old React had classes, yet new React has these hooks. And so the hook here is the one that begins with use on line two there. So it's use state. So everything that begins with use is um, almost certainly guaranteed to be a hook in, in modern React. Um, and so it made what would have been a, a large class with a bunch of this and a constructor and everything um, into this like really clean abstraction. But it's not just about uh, cleanness. Um, I have another slide here. Uh, oh, here's another example. So this was use state. So this is the thing that replaces this dot set state, and um, this is the part that uh, that replaces any sort of side effect. So the example side effect here is like changing the document title, right? Um, and so the idea is that we will just uh, update this title whenever count changes. And when does count change? And how does this get called? And how is it you know figured out? Uh, or diffed or whatever, like we don't care because we're just, we, we have the luxury of, of having a layer of abstraction between us and the browser, so we don't have to think about the inner details of that. All we just know is I'm just going to say this inner function uh, depends on uh, one variable from the outer function. That's what's in the braces there, in the square braces um, at the bottom of the red square. So uh, we just say this inner function depends on one piece of information from the outer function, count, and besides that, um, React, do your thing. And, and so that's really cool. Uh, what does it give us? Uh, cleaner code, less code, which is you know important. Less code, less surface area for bugs in certain ways. Um, there's some other quirkiness that are introduced by hooks, um, areas, foot guns, so to speak. But um, in general, much cleaner code. And we get rid of classes in this. Because one of the biggest kind of faults of classes in JavaScript is that they were a syntactic sugar on top of uh, essentially prototypal inheritance, which is hard for people to grasp and understand. And um, and, and this behaves in a weird way because it has this, this concept of runtime or late binding. Uh, but anyway, we don't have to think about it anymore. It, it's like beautiful. I don't write the word this in my React code anymore at all, um, like for the past year, really. Uh, and they're composable. I, I think that's really a selling point because, like, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get the world to move to a new way of writing code just to, so they can get rid of classes. Uh, I, th I think the key to this is that it's composable. So I can now write a hook, share a hook, and, and you can pull it in. So in the same way that UI used to be composable or, uh, with React, like one of the fundamental things about React that, that made it really different from other frameworks of the time is that it had this concept of these composable you know, components. And, and you would, um, you, you'd pull in this component and create a new component that is, that is built off of that. Uh, and so now, so, so that was great with views. But it didn't work with logic. Like, like there was not a clean way to compose logic in React uh, prior to hooks. And so hooks came out to solve that problem. It was like, hey, I need to pull in a hook from NPM that I don't know the inner workings of, but I don't care because it's a layer of abstraction away from me. Uh, and I want to use that and build my own new hook on top of it and compose it together. So that's kind of where hooks came from. Um, anyway, there's an excellent set of built-in hooks. We don't have to worry about higher order component mess, which is if, you, if you've lived through that 
particularly challenging time of JavaScript uh, of React history, you you will remember how many layers of higher order components you have, and it was just like hard to keep track of. Um, and then lastly, we, we kind of get um, in, in this new world of where TypeScript kind of dominates uh, React development. We we get um, we we care that things are strongly typed because as soon as it's strongly typed, then it plugs right into the TypeScript ecosystem to our editor tooling to our you know build uh, static code analysis stuff. And so the, the fact that they're really cleanly, strongly typed works well. Uh, and so naturally, you know, uh, the hooks came out. And it was like, this is a, a upgrade path that you can choose to take. But you know, don't, re don't rewrite all of your code right away. Just you know, use the right tool for the job. So naturally, like, the entire community, we like, rewrote everything within a year. Like, I've never seen. Um, I guess any ecosystem rewrite all of their code so quickly um, to a new paradigm, but uh, but it happened, right? And so now almost every major React and React Native library has been rewritten to support hooks. So it's really cool. And part of it is that it was actually kind of fun to, to rewrite into hooks. It, it was really like to, to watch this much code disappear and come out as this much code and easier to read was, was like really um, satisfying. So um, so that was hooks. Um, but I think, you know, if we step away from looking at React on web, and we look at like what is the other big thing that has happened in the last five years, uh, I would say that it's React on other platforms. Um, so it was already starting in 2015 at the beginning. We already started with uh, iOS, um, and so React Native was was the first kind of technology to bring React to another platform. It was announced in February of 2015, and um, but you know it was like super buggy. Like if anybody, it, if any of you guys have have used React Native in its first, I don't know, year probably, you remember what a challenge it was. It was a, it was just really. <laughs> you remember that? Mark's raising his hand. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, we got a few who remember this. And it was like there there was no navigation out of the box. There was like some kind of half baked solutions and uh, that would call into native code. There was no. Um, There's so many things that were missing. Uh, but it was okay because it it. The only reason why it was okay is because it was like, yeah, look, um, we can't replace everything you could dream of right now. Um, you still expect to do native work. Like, expect to still do certain pieces of your workflow in native land, but at least most of your business, most of your business logic can be done in JavaScript in, in a way that is cross-platform, but you're still gonna have to write some native code. That was kind of the initial, the initial selling point of React Native was like, I'm not, um, this isn't a write once, run everywhere. This is a learn once, kind of use that knowledge everywhere, right? Um, learn React on web, which presumably you already had at that time, or at least a lot of the target audience had, um, and, and apply that knowledge on, on mobile, and it was really cool. But, um, but of course, as a community, we were not satisfied with that. We're like, no, 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 I don't want to just like do 80% of my app in, Re in JavaScript and React. Uh, I want to do all of it. So, um, so we slowly started over the past five years building tooling. Um, uh, and so, um, on the topic of React Native, it is probably the most influential cross-platform solution, mobile solution, to date. Um, there has a few strong competitors now. Um, prior to React Native, really the only one of note at all was uh, Ionic, right? Um, which was built on Cordova or whatever. So, um, but but after this, now we have a few more to choose from: Native Script, uh, which works well with Angular, uh, Flutter. Um, uh, there's one that has very quietly come out of Google. Um, in typical Google fashion, Apple came out with a big stage uh, uh, hoorah and announced Swift UI, and they're like, it's going to change the world. Um, and then Google like quietly snuck something into their um, Google I.O. last year, which is called uh, Jetpack Compose. Has anybody here heard of Jetpack Compose? It is a way of using Kotlin to write cross-platform apps. So it's, it's super young, but it's really cool. It's worth checking out. But um, but the key takeaway is that there are other alternatives to React Native now, but I would say React Native is probably the most influential um, of the past five years, which is cool. And like any web developer can jump in and just start being a mobile dev. It was, it was like, I remember doing that jump right from web to mobile, and I'm like, this, is, this feels really powerful um, to, uh, uh, to be able to just like, be a mobile dev with the knowledge I already have. I didn't have to learn too much. It was cool. Um, and create these really immersive, like sixty frame per second kind of experiences. It wasn't like just putting HTML on the phone. It was like building real native stuff. Um, and and since then, we have this incredible ecosystem of packages from navigation and animation and gesture handling and uh, you know Bluetooth and audio and video and 
uh, all kinds of stuff. So uh, world-class companies like uh, Shopify and Wix and uh, Microsoft, to, to a large extent, um, are, are pushing this, this stuff forward. So um, that was a whirlwind tour of React Native, and uh, we're not even done. <laughs> like, we've got, like, we're covering a lot of stuff here. So stop me if you guys think you want to talk about any of this. Uh, can I just jump in with a quick question? Uh, my, this might be out of left field, but uh, what about, uh, you mentioned VS Code being developed on uh, TypeScript. Mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what does that technology stack looks like? it look like to deploy that stuff on uh, desktop uh, OSs? Oh, right. Um, so it's Electron. So Electron is essentially web views, right? Um, I was wondering how I mean, that fit into things. Yep. And, and um, and we're actually going to get in a moment to how you can use React Native in Electron as well to build kind of native um, uh, desktop type apps. But yeah, it, like Electron's one of those things where it's like web uh, technologies on mobile never really took off in the way that that people predicted. So in like whatever it was, like 2012, 13, um, people were like, HTML5 is the future. It will be on every device because, you know, JavaScript and HTML is already understood by every device. It will be the future. But the, the performance, it was really hard to extract performance out of it on mobile um, because phones just aren't as, as good at getting 60 frames per second on um, web technologies. Um, but maybe the one area where that dream was realized is the desktop because, like, if you think about most of the desktop apps that you use today, besides, like, the big old school stuff like Photoshop, but, like, the modern stuff like Slack, um, uh, I think you know Microsoft Teams, um, Skype. Uh, I don't know if anybody uses Skype anymore. Um, I'm just trying to like rattle things off that are all built with kind of Electron and web technologies that are wrapped in web views, uh, VS Code, right? Um, tons and tons of things. Uh, anyway, yeah. So, so that's kind of where HTML5 did get make its way to native native applications was was with uh, Electron. So um, there, there's some performance and, and uh, challenges there too, but. Anyway, um, uh, Simon, uh, you mentioned something uh, like a new feature about uh, for React. You said uh, they replace this set state. Can you go back on that? Like you know, like where they replace. This yeah. One. Hooks. Does it? Uh, I think we already kind of did a show of hands who, who's touched hooks. So hooks is just the um, kind of replacement for. Um, for the word this. So any, anytime you see the word this or the word class, then you're you're looking at kind of older style of React. And anytime you're seeing um, the word use like this, then you're seeing the, you're using the newer style of React. Uh, it's it's fairly backwards compatible in that um, if 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 button here, so here I'm using button. If button was a class component, I wouldn't know or care. As the consumer of that library, I wouldn't really know what button is written in, and I wouldn't care because it works the same way. I'm just passing props. Uh, the difference is if um, Let's say instead of use state here, I had some custom hook called use navigation that was built by an NPM author. I could not use that inside my class component. So I cannot have a class called app that uses the, the, the hook called use navigation, um, which you know a lot of people are like, oh my goodness, this is breaking backwards compatibility. This is gonna be a deal breaker. But it turns out there was a, just an easy workaround in that I could just kind of like make a very thin wrapper uh, functional component that just composes my, my class component like this. So um, I, I kind of glossed over that a little bit. But um, I don't know. Does that kind of help answer your question, Sir Sugar? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, I haven't done much JavaScript lately, but I've been playing with hooks a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, it didn't seem to, it doesn't work with the uh, compon component classes, right? You say there's no classes mm -hmm. anymore. So hooks only work with function like uh, basic components. Yeah, and I should show you an example of what to do um, to make that work, but remind me at the end. Um, yeah, and, I mean, I know there's a kind of workaround, but yeah. uh, uh, also, I mean, uh, a lot of the a lot of the class components work better with uh, with Redux, and you see you don't use Redux anymore. So, what what do you use today uh, for, instead of Redux? Um, mostly, uh, we have a few hooks like use dispatch and use context. Um, but like honestly, I use a lot of Apollo. So um, a lot of my state for f at least for my fetching stuff, a lot of that state happens in Apollo. And of course, Apollo is a whole other probably topic to, to discuss. But Apollo is a GraphQL library, uh, which technically can work with REST as well. But 
I just said, oh yeah, because I've I've been we we still use Redux and we still have our challenges, and I've been wondering what's the next incarnation. So. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it's a hard question to answer because um, there isn't like one answer to that, right? So it's it's like um, there's there might be one answer for just sharing navigation state, and there might be a different answer for sharing data fetching type state or logic, um, and there might be a different answer for uh, um, uh, s like component style stuff that exists within a page. And so uh, um, it 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 has taken multiple turns, and so there isn't a clean answer to that, but. Um, when in doubt, I reach for uh, hooks, I think. Yeah, if I don't know what else to use, I, I reach for one of several different hooks. Uh, one of them is called use dispatch, which use dispatch um, to, to, to say something positive about the success of Redux. Redux was so successful in the industry that it has influenced, like it basically has crept into React core, meaning that the, the, the use dispatch hook that comes with React is essentially a, a slimmed down version of Redux. So it is, um, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why Redux itself as a library is not um, maybe the most popular anymore. It's because it just sort of got, you know, merged into core, right? In a sense. Um, cool. Stuff like, uh, stuff like uh, you know, API calls and partial data uploads and stuff like that, I mean, uh, downloads. Do you have a, a preference? Um, you mean a, a preference between using something like Redux and using something else? I mean, yeah, I, I, mean, know. I don't know. Apollo, you seem, Apollo seems to be oh. GraphQL-centric, right? Is it working it is with very, other Yeah, uh, you're right. It, it's very GraphQL-centric. Um, there is something called Apollo HTTP link, which allows you to, um, or Apollo REST link or something, which allows you to kind of query normal endpoints in the same way, like by writing this GraphQL, it, it, it's a hack. Um, so to, to answer your question, um, if I'm doing an upload, I will, I don't know, these days actually, GraphQL handles file uploads really well, um, basic file uploads, yeah. So I'd probably use that out of the box to some extent. I've been dealing a lot with uh, partial data, like getting okay. some data and then go back and get more and. Uh, right. things that are, are like on long, long running threads and stuff like that. Got it. Um, so you have yeah. to kind of ping, ping your API to see, okay, do I have data now? Yes. Okay. Give me some, et cetera. Right. That's kind of yeah. like a cycle as to come from the UI, right? Right. Um, yeah. So polling is kind of what you described. And then also kind of when you talk about partial data loading, it makes me think of like pagination, right? So it's like, hey, give me the first 10 records, give me 10 records more. So all of that is is to some extent built into Apollo. Um, but yeah, I mean, like there are times like happily fall back to a normal REST endpoint if you need to um, for any of those things. And, um, and and you still can, right? You can use Fetch, you can use uh, Axios or whatever kind of libraries people love. Um, yeah, you can totally use that stuff. Uh, and then just put that inside of a state, like a use state or a use dispatch, I should say. Yeah, so um, I'm probably giving a very, very like hand wavy answer to that, but but I think the general answer is, uh, you know, use the right tool for the job. And and uh, the library authors behind libraries like Apollo, they try to make it uh, have at least a working solution for everything you could encounter, from subscriptions and web sockets and things like that, all the way through to um, you know file uploads. So so they definitely put the effort in. These library authors are putting the effort in to make sure that uh, it, it works for those cases. But yeah, I mean, like if it makes sense to use a, an endpoint, uh, a, a normal REST endpoint go nuts, right? So um, another quick question. The use state here, is it local to the function or is it uh, global? The thing of Redux was to be a global store that you can go f grab from anywhere, right? When the state was local to the component. So is yeah. this use state hook uh, global or local? Local. That's a, it's very local. If you want to make it global, you um, need to combine it with use context. So use context um, in combination with use state works really well for, I don't want to say global in, in the sense that you don't always put it at your very, very top level, but some level, some number of layers higher than this, you can essentially hoist your uh, your state up there. The 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 Achilles heel of, of Redux, I guess, was two pe two pieces. One, the global, you know, you mentioned global state. That was uh, 
that has its own flaws in terms of performance, right? There are times when it's like, I don't need the state of my dropdown or, you know, certain little kind of smaller pieces of state to be global. Uh, you know, m maybe it doesn't make sense to make it global and then you end up with some perf issues with doing that. Um, perf issues that could be solved with, um, we had some really good libraries like, uh, what was the select one? It was like Redux Select or something. There's some really cool ones. Um, however, uh, the other, I think, Thing, uh, kind of nail in the coffin or, or Achilles heel of um, Redux was the boilerplate, right? So, so people wanted to be able to not have to add five different files in five different locations to add a little bit of state. Um, you know, because you'd have to create your reducer, you might have to mess with the middleware, you might have to create a thunk, you might have to create some kind of like, you know, or if you're not using thunks, you're creating like a, um, a, a, a saga or something. Um, there was just a lot of pieces. Create your actions. Together. <clears throat> oh yep. my gosh. Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> and so it, 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 that was a selling point at first. It was like, hey, look how cleanly separated there are. These are separated into five different locations. And then after a while, it was like, I don't want to separate everything into five locations, right? I just want it like, you know. So and it, I guess there's this battle between like the ergonomics and then the kind of, uh, um, I don't know what you would call it, the, the like the by the books. I just want to add something too. So this is one of the things that I saw, uh, that I found to be troublesome about using Redux was like it can be powerful and stuff, but um, a lot of times I would hear others say, just use it for the global state all the time. And it was like, okay, so you mean to not use the local state, but always rely on Redux for state? And that can be overkill. Because if you, if like this example is a good one where it's just like, hey, I just need local state and that's it. I don't need Redux. Um, and so I thought there was a bit of confusion for certain people, even like, you know, various um, uh, educational videos on, on how to use Redux. Yeah, that's kind of like the Redux way of doing it. But, you know, you also have to kind of temper that with, um, like, does it make sense, like, use the right tool for the job, right? Um, and it doesn't always make sense to put everything in Redux. But you're right, those training videos, keep in mind the training videos, if they're sold as, hey, I'm going to teach you how to use Redux, of course they're going to, like, push Redux to its, like, logical sort of extreme, right? Um, Whereas like the creator of Redux, Dan Neighbormob, was like, hey, Redux is not always the right tool. So, you know, he, he's very, but he's known for that being very kind of like uh, pragmatic with, with even the, the things that he creates, right? Uh, anywho, so that, that was uh, a deep dive into hooks there. Um, uh, and, and I don't have a ton of slides left. So anyway, this was Dan Abramov saying, don't rewrite everything in hooks. Uh, and we did. Um, oh yeah, and then we talked about React on other platforms. And then we have Expo. And so Expo, uh, interestingly, was made by an ex-Facebooker ex named um, Charlie, I forget what his name is, Shiva or something. And, and, and they were a uh, Y Combinator summer 2015, I want to say, or 2016, one of those two years. And they, so, so they, they were like right on the heels of React Native coming out and being like, hey, we need to fill in the blanks. We need to make the developer experience that React Native doesn't provide. And I don't know that they succeeded at first. Like, I was a big fan. It used to be called Exponent. And, and when it was Exponent, like, early, early days, I was a big fan. Um, but a lot of people kind of struggled with, with it and, and was like, oh, you know, maybe this isn't as, as good as it claims to be. Um, and then slowly it matured over time. And then, you know, if you get the opportunity to take another look at Expo and you're like, holy cow, this has, like, gotten really good over the past two years. Like, this is nuts. And um, to give you an idea of what Expo is, so, you know, like I said, it's the missing toolkit for React Native. Um, it provides these libraries, and the SDK is the key piece there, that, uh, that you need on mobile devices that isn't provided by React Native out of the, out of the box. And I, and I think that's where React Native has failed in compared to, compared to uh, frameworks like Flutter. So Flutter gives you everything you need out of the box. Typical like Google, right? So like Angular gives you so much more out of the box. And React was like, yeah, here's a view library. How do I fetch data? I don't know, figure it out, right? And then some, somebody else comes up with seven different solutions. And, and so that's typical React ecosystem. So React Native came out of the React ecosystem where it's like, hey, I'll, I'll let you render views and text inputs on a mobile device, but nothing else. How do I deal with Bluetooth? Don't know. How do I deal with push notifications? Who cares? Figure it out, right? And so um, I think developers wanted more than what React Native provides. So, um, so libraries like Expo came along and was like, hey, why don't we actually give you push notifications and Bluetooth and video playing and audio playing and being able to run something in the background um, and uh, I'm trying to think what else, like tons and tons of stuff, like everything from like dark mode and appearance and internationalization and um, like everything that you would need to build a mobile app these days, I find myself not needing to reach for anything that's not within here. 
Um, in fact, they even though technically React Navigation is not part of the Expo library, the Expo team maintains React Navigation. So like even the pieces that are the most popular in the community are built by the Expo folks. So and then on top of that, they give you this online online playground, which is like nuts. Like never in the history of mobile development were you able to like type in some code on an online little editor on a web page and like run it natively on your mobile device. And this allowed that through a bunch of different trickery that a lot of people thought Apple wasn't going to allow, but somehow they, they got around that um, and Apple hasn't taken them down yet. But yeah, you can run, you can type in code onto a web page and run it on your mobile device. And it was, it's really cool. So uh, the online playground is called Snack. Has anybody seen Snack? Is it worth pulling this up? Do it. So snack.expo.io, this is how it works. Um, you write in this code here. You click on iOS, and it says, OK, run it on your device. Oh, it's still thinking. Um, so, you, so you write it. You, you type in some React Native code. You press Run on your device, and it shows you a QR code. You open up the, um, the Expo kind of runner on your app, the Expo mobile app, and you scan the QR code, and it just runs the code. It, it, it essentially downloads the JavaScript, um, does this little build magic, downloads it, and then executes it on the phone, which is why everybody was like, whoa, I don't know how Apple's going to feel about this. We're going to download code off the internet and run it, like execute it on the phone. Um, but somehow it's acceptable, and they got away with that. Uh, so anyway, it, it's really cool. You can just um, uh, run it on your device. This tap to play thing is, is kind of this other kind of emulator in the cloud simulator thing. But, um, but yeah, you, you can do the same thing with Android. And then uh, web we'll get to in a minute. But web is uh, kind of next on my slide here, as you can see. Uh, so oh, yeah, and then the build pipeline before I move on. So online playground is, was just like, wow, people were, were stunned by that. And then on top of that, you get this build pipeline where you actually can write the code in you know your, your VS code or your online playground or whatever. And then you send it up to. Um, Expo servers, and this is all free somehow. I don't know how they're paying their bills, but this is all free. You send it up to Expo servers, and they will build it for you into an APK for Android or an IPA for iOS. Um, and that's where the automation tools comes in. It will not only just build it, but then you can actually get it to upload it to test flight. So the whole thing is done in the cloud. Um, and you just run this Expo, like I think it's called Expo Upload iOS, and then just like imagine, you know, and you have to put in your API, your uh, uh, Apple team ID, and a few keys or whatever, and then it just kind of like puts it up to test flight for you. So you can now write a mobile app without ever opening Xcode, So, which is something that React Native could not say in the past. They, they couldn't claim that, but Expo is like, we've cracked that nut. You can, in theory, you can write an iOS app on, window, on a Windows computer now. Right? You write your JavaScript code. You don't have to open Xcode to build it because you send it to the build pipeline on the Expo servers. It builds it, and then, you, and then it will upload it to, uh, you run this one command, and it will upload it to uh, App Store Connect or whatever it's called. So, uh, so the tooling here is just like all over the board. And then on top of that, they're like, "Well, Expo is not cool enough yet. We're going to add Expo Web." And so, Expo Web is created by a dude named Evan Bacon uh, down in Palo Alto, who is uh, kind of the uh, face of Expo these days. He's kind of the. Um, if you guys got a chance to uh, watch React Europe, which was the conference happening today, um, he he did a talk on this uh, during that. And so the idea is that now you can write one code base to run on web, on uh, iOS, and on Android. And the video that I'm going to show you here, which I stole from uh, Evan, who created this, uh, is this video right here. And so uh, if I press play, what you're going to see, hopefully, is um, editing code up here in the right-hand corner, and then pressing save, and then the fast refresh kicks in and just reloads it on all three devices. So. Uh, Let's hit it. So there's some kind of um, oh yeah so so oh yeah we're changing state so we're intentionally hitting bump to change the state and then we're pressing save on the browser uh, on the editor and then it updated all of them without losing their state so it's like hot reload and now we're bumping the state again I guess and we go over here we, we're going to take out the little smiley face we're going to press save and then boom it's like updated across all devices and um, and the state did not get thrown away. Yeah, fast refresh is like another thing that um, somehow is all part of this whole ecosystem, and it's it's pretty magical in a, in a good way. So, so fast refresh came from I want to say Dan Abramov, which is kind of where a lot of this stuff comes from, and then the Expo team came up with the kind of cross-platform stuff here. So, uh, <clears throat> I have built and deployed 
things that work across web and iOS and Android with a single code base using Expo Web, and it is um, it's magical. It's, it's good stuff. So Expo yeah, Web is is using uh, like a web view in the on on mobile, or how does that work? No. Um, so on the mobile, it's normal React Native, uh, which is you know. That's probably a longer discussion. Is how does React Native work if it's not using a web view? That, that's a that's a longer discussion. But the short answer to that is um, it takes your JavaScript and sends it across to uh, across the quote unquote bridge to, or technically sends certain commands across the bridge to native side, and native renders real native views uh, on both iOS and Android. Now for web, huh? Yeah, I mean in React Native, don't you have to write still write for each uh, platform? Um, not necessarily. So I think there was a time when that narrative was coming out of Facebook, and Facebook was like, you know, hey, you get some code sharing, but you still have to kind of write for each platform. Um, but in, but that's not really the case anymore. So I generally do not write specialized code for each platform. I mean, besides a few small things like shadows work a little bit differently on iOS than Android. So you have a few little branching where you have to write slightly, a slight bit of code slightly differently for one platform than the other. Like an action sheet, for example, right? Like you don't get an action sheet out of the box with Android, um, and you do get it with iOS, or like date pickers work a little bit differently. But anyway, to answer your question in broad strokes, you do not need to write separate code for Android and iOS with React Native. Um, and what Expo Web has now done, which is actually built on something called React Native Web out of Twitter, so um, it is, it, you know, kind of stand on the shoulders of giants kind of thing. Like everybody's adding one more layer on top of this stuff, right? So Facebook created React Native, Twitter created React Native Web, and then Expo kind of built on top of that. Um, React Native Web, or, or Expo Web in this case, is a way of taking views and texts, things that are primitive, primitives of the iOS and Android platform, and finding the closest equivalent, you know, a div or a text input or whatever, they're finding the clo closest web equivalent and applying a bunch of styling to make it work. It, it, it's, th that's a, that's a, that answer does not do it justice. But uh, to answer your question, we are not using web views on mobile. We are using web technology on web, and it is uh, pretty cool. Yeah, and, and I can show it to you over here. Uh, so in its simplest form, uh, we might want to just return a view with a text that says hello, and I'm going to remove this thing called a card, and I'm going to remove asset example, and I'm going to remove uh, this. Okay, so in its simplest form, let me hit on the web one here. So here I've written hello inside of a text, which is inside of a view, and if we were to inspect element, we would see that it has just converted that to like pretty clean HTML. Um, take the word clean with a grain of salt because it's going to have a few cryptic class names, but you know these class names are auto-generated. Um, these class names are auto-generated, like CSS 901A0A or whatever. Th those are like irrelevant. But the idea is that if you look at this div that relates to this, so this text has been compiled to a div, and sometimes it gets compiled to a span, and other times to a div, depending on what React Native web needs to choose to make it work right. And then it just added one, two, three, four, five class names, which is not outrageous. The class names are a bit weird to look at, um, just because the way they're auto-generated, but ultimately, it is just a div with some classes. And that's it, and, and they map kind of one-to-one. -one. So one React element here maps to one div, and this one maps to a different div, and then some of the other stuff is is uh, some boilerplate. But and you you see that in the component debugger. Um, what do you mean? I mean, do you see like in your you have components here on the, on your as one of the tab for React debug, right? The React uh... oh, directly in the middle of the screen, the components. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's a plugin um, from Re that's uh, that's there because of this React extension. Um, that, that's what that is. That looks like a mess. But um, that's, oh, you know what that I'm looking at? Oh, that's because I'm looking at the editor's um, stuff. Okay, sorry. How about I look at the actual, um, yeah, so because this isn't an iframe, I probably have to pop it out. So let me just pop it out of the iframe and we'll try again. Um, you wanted to see over here, if I look in my components, yeah, it's just here, a text view app. 
app is inside of a view of you and, and anonymous. But um, so so everything above this word app is kind of boilerplate from the framework, and everything below there is my code. So it very cleanly. Um, oh, and um, to that point, uh, Twitter is twitter.com uh, is indeed um, written in React Native Web. So they, I mean, they created it. Um, they created it, and then Expo kind of adopted it and wrapped it. But you see, like all these things feel the same. Like they have that same kind of style of uh, CSS classes and everything. Um, if I were to click over to components, you would see that they are also just texts and views with a little bit of kind of Twitter rep magical wrappers. But um, but yeah, this entire Twitter website is built using React Native for web. And the classes are always under 140 characters. <laughs> yes. Yeah, under 140 characters. That's hey, right. Hey, uh, so I got I got a question here. Unless you need, if there's other things that you're gonna continue to go off of. Oh man, hit me. What do you got? Uh, just curious about gotchas. Um, I'll just say this really quick. So I'm actually I just got back into using React Native, and I'm trying to do something ambitious, but I'm trying to use an existing API that we have that was built to utilize only. Um, Interfacing with UI uh, web web UI clients, and so I'm curious if you've run into gotcha if you've done something similar and run into gotchas uh, with trying to use a React React Native app to um, yeah to connect to uh, to APIs. Um, okay, so uh, maybe at first I was thinking you meant it was built to be used on the web in terms of um, actual divs and spans and stuff. If that's the case, you can't just paste it into React Native. You, you have to actually kind of rewrite it into use React Native's primitives. But it, in your case, it sounds like maybe you're just saying that it uses web APIs in, in terms of like, yeah. Well, I'll give you one very specific thing. So I'm having a problem dealing with cookies. So uh, one of the things we need to do whenever we connect with our API servers, we have to send cookies and something about send, um, like setting uh, headers and whatnot. Yeah. Right now, that's kind of yeah. a, a black box to me. And I'm just like, WTF. Um, and what's happening is that as I'm using my React Native app, <clears throat> uh, I'm not able to give the proper data to um, uh, to our API server, and so. Yep. My guess is that the problem you're facing is because React Native will not automatically manage cookies for you for a number of reasons, including that cookies are tightly coupled to the concept of a uh, origin, and there's no concept of origin in React Native. So an origin is like the, the domain and the port number that you're on in, in the address bar. So there's like things about the address bar that are tightly coupled with the concept of cookie management. So what it, all it means is you have to just manage that yourself. So if you make a request and the response comes back with some kind of a cookie header, you gotta manually grab that cookie, save it somewhere in memory, and then you need to manually reattach that cookie to your next request for subsequent requests because it the browser does a lot of that weirdness for you to uh, actually to a fault, right? Like the browser, like a lot of browser security flaws and cross-site scripting and everything is is because of the way browser handles cookies. So none of that exists in, in uh, React Native. So you just got to write the cookie handling logic yourself. But you can access the headers with no problem. Right. Yep. Okay. But that makes that brings up a good point, which is React Native Web and React, how are they different? Or I, I, sorry, I should say React Native and React, normal React, how are they different? And that's one example is that once you're outside of the browser, you don't have a concept of uh, origins and, and address bars and locations and page.refresh and navigator.whatever and back and forward. Um, you don't have a concept of, of cookies in the same way. Um, yeah, uh, even the browser by default, if you put one thing on the page, the browser kind of gives you this concept of a body, which can be which is scrollable by default. You know, if it overflows, it scrolls. You don't get that on, on, on React Native, right? React Native isn't going to insert a scroll view for you automatically. It's up to you to put scroll views in there. So if you want to emulate what the kind of behavior of the browser is, which is where if you just put a bunch of text that it will just start scrolling, you have to wrap that in a scroll view. So you have to do a little bit more by hand because it doesn't make <clears throat> um, assumptions as much as, as the web platform does, if that makes sense. It kind of makes sense because it's trying to um, get you to think like the, like uh, uh, app developers, right? Or mobile app developers. Yes, right. Exactly. So that's the way iOS works. iOS works. Yeah, you have to. If you want a scroll view, you got to put a scroll view in there, and then you got to say if it's horizontal or vertical or whatever. So that's true. Um, and there's no CSS animations, so you have to use an animation library like Reanimated, which is fairly complex. Like there's multiple different libraries you can choose for animations, but it's not. It's not just like quick define a quick transition and then boom. You have to actually put some effort into state management and things. So, 
Um, you know, building for mobile is inherently a little bit more low level or complex than building for web in certain ways, uh, and that is intentional, but then there's libraries that kind of abstract that away a bit. I a question. Um, how is memory performance uh, using React Native as opposed to something like Electron? Because I remember when Electron first came out, um, there was a lot of criticism of uh, around like, why do I need an entire instance of a browser to render, for instance, Hello World? Why do I need to spend 500 megabytes uh, of memory yeah, just right. to render simple text? Um, has that improved over time? Um, with Electron, I don't know that it has, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, probably not. Um, no, I mean, maybe small incremental improvements. But like fundamentally, the thing with Electron is it has to spin up an entire instance of Chrome. I mean, technically, it's a subset of Chrome. It's something based on Chromium. It has to spin up the whole, effectively, Chrome web browser for every single app you launch. And Chrome, by its nature, is just a heavy thing. I mean, you, you know, some people say web browsers are almost as complex as an operating system these days, and maybe there's, there's some truth to that. There's just so much in a web browser that um, that uh, uh, the the drawback of using web technologies wrapped in an in an app like the way Electron works is that yeah you have that overhead, and so I, I doubt that that has improved significantly. Um, however, to answer your other question, which is how does React Native compare to that? React Native does not have the overhead of launching an entire Chrome or entire web browser. It only has the overhead of launching an entire JavaScript runtime, which has uh, some impact, sure, on memory. Um, but on Android, it uses um, there's this new thing that we that we will that I actually have a slide for later on um, called Her the Hermes engine, um, which is brand new out of Facebook, rewritten from the ground up, a JavaScript engine that they wrote specifically to be lightweight on memory and 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 fast. And so the idea is that on on iOS it's fine. I don't know why because the way iOS works is that the the, the JavaScript core is just like so tightly integrated with the operating system. It's just like really quick. And plus, and iOS devices are fairly fast anyway in comparison um, to like kind of the average Android device. Um, you know, not comparing to a Galaxy S9 or whatever. But um, the uh, so Facebook has written their own JavaScript engine called Hermes, which is uh, technically still behind an experimental flag, so you have to turn it on. But um, then you get this really lightweight JavaScript engine on Android devices that doesn't have any of the memory issues that you just talked about. So um, it's uh, and, and it's used in production for a lot of Facebook products. So um, our iOS is just is still using the JavaScript core, which ships with iOS. It's like made by Apple and it's fast. Cool, um, but yeah, there's some overhead there for sure. In, in general, if you're yeah, if you're kind of building a something that's not truly truly native, yeah, there's some overhead, sure. Um, that was Expo Web, which is really exciting, and I don't think you know I could do a whole talk on Expo Web. I think that this just scratches the surface of what's possible with Expo Web, but. Um, We've unlocked now. Uh, we've we've gotten to the level that we've just layered enough really powerful um, hard work for many developers in the community onto the React ecosystem that now we've reached peak. What is it? It's like uh, um, inception, where it's like we wrote React for web. We then wrote React Native, which is based on React for mobile, and now we've now ported React Native back over to web, and we've come full circle. So. Um, you know, I mean, what we've done in a really cool way, and so I think that the React Native web stuff is um, is is worth using, for sure. Okay, so which brings us to the next point, which you guys have really been talking about, which is Electron. So uh, Expo Web now also supports Electron, and so if you go to um, there's a demo video somewhere floating around the web, which is where instead of so in this video here we saw three devices, iOS, Android, and, and web browser, being updated with one code base, fast refresh, and everything. If you go out on the, um, if you go out on the Twitters or the internet and you look for the video where it says uh, that announces the Electron support for Expo, it will, it adds another, you know, Windows, I think, and Mac, because uh, the, the selling point of Electron is that it can run on Windows and Mac. So you add two more to this, to this thing here. So now you have Windows native, Mac native, web browser, uh, Android, iOS, and you get five. So we've, um, and we're not done yet, but anyway, so we've hit five. We're like, we can run on five different devices. Um, and, and, and that's really cool. So uh, I guess Expo, I don't know if their goals are a little bit too lofty, but they're trying to hit like every possible device in existence with one code base and they're 
somehow doing a good job of it. So uh, Expo, uh, Expo also supports Electron for Mac and Windows applications. Um, on what? I would think that Electron supports Linux. So um, if they probably just haven't, probably just wasn't part of their announcement. But yeah, I, I think if Electron supports Linux out of the box and uh, Expo supports Electron, then it's probably most of the way there. If not, provide it. But yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who in the world has you know vested interest in supporting GUI applications on Linux, and I'm guessing I mean Google is one of them probably just because Google has a lot of Linux. Linux is deep in their kind of company culture. Like like if you work at Google, most of the workstations are Linux workstations, um, and and then of course you can choose to get on top of your workstation you can choose to get a a laptop which is either Chrome or Mac or I don't I don't think they allow you to get Windows. Um, if you're an engineering, if you're in the engineering department, you can't get a Windows machine. But you can get Mac or Chromebook or Linux, and then your but but your powerhouse, your workstation is is always Linux, and it has their own build of a um, UI called G Linux or something like that. Um, I forget. But anyway, so so there are companies in the world that are heavily invested in Linux. Um, but as far as the consumer space, I don't know that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know who who's really heavy in that consumer space that would push for that. Um, okay, so on top of that, we're on slide 49 now. Uh, so on top of all of that cool stuff with Expo and everything, uh, Microsoft has thrown their uh, um, horse in the race, is that the expression? And Microsoft has announced real React Native support for Windows and Mac, not using Electron, not using HTML, not using web views, but like actual native support for React Native on both Windows and Mac, which is kind of surprising because why would Microsoft want to support Mac? I don't know. This is my, this new Microsoft is is not computing in my brain like what they're what they're up to. But um, anyway, so they have announced this. This is their website here, Microsoft.GitHub.io slash React Native Windows, and uh, it is both for Mac and Windows, and evidently there's a PlayStation in there for some reason. Or no, that's an Xbox, I mean. PlayStation is the wrong one. Wrong word choice when talking to Windows, uh, Microsoft. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it's all, it's all blurring together in my brain now. It's too many devices to support. So uh, Microsoft has, I think, a vested interest in supporting Mac, maybe only because they do, their productivity suite is a big money maker for them. So what I mean by that is Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Office, those kind of things um, kind of need to run on many devices, and they probably just don't want to build it in native, uh, uh, you know, Objective C or whatever. So they they're contributing this kind of tooling. It's really cool. Uh, and is this production ready? I don't know. Um, I think for Windows, yes, and I think for Mac, it's it's pretty early. I think it was recently announced. So. Um, so React has now. Say again. I was, I was along the same lines. I was going to say maybe Microsoft's interest is basically just like as a counter uh, counter to Swift uh, and Objective C and the like, right? They, they have a have an interest in more open technologies, so developers can work on Windows as well as Mac, and not just be in Apple sandbox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, like Microsoft's key demographic, which is enterprise and big corporates and stuff, they don't even think about Mac, right? Like, I don't think any of them are even, you know. Mac's not even on their radar, right? I mean, like we're in this little bubble of the world where for us we're just like, if if I wanted to find somebody with a Windows computer that I could like run some Windows application on, I don't even think I have it. I know anybody who has one, like, but but that is not indicative of the rest of the US or the rest of the world. And so, you know, when I go home to the Midwest and I go to a dev conference, it's all very Microsoft-y, right? Um, people are deep in that ecosystem. So I, I think you're right. It, it probably provides both so that the people in our little bubble can be like, oh, I, I can support Windows for free kind of out of the box. I'll do it. And then the, um, the rest of the world can be like, oh, I can support Mac as well out of the box. OK, sure. Right? So you kind of get best, best of both. I'm on a Windows box, by the way. Gotcha. OK, cool. I do know one person then. OK. Uh, I, I know I'm, I'm kind of over generalizing, but um, but no, it is it is more rare here to see a developer on on Windows here, whereas like um, yeah, in corporate America, it's all development on Windows, right? Yeah. Well, now that we've got uh, VS Code and uh, WSL, it's a lot more compelling. That's right. And VS Code has that really cool um, 
remote whatever that that uh, so you can run your so your code base can live in WSL or on a virtual machine or whatever, but you can develop on um, it. Kind of separates the. I'm not explaining that well. Um, I'll have to pull that up at some point to try to explain that better. But anyway, there's a way to essentially your code lives on the Windows subsystem for Linux, and then your but but your UI lives on the Windows side. It's pretty cool. Uh, okay, so looking forward, uh, what's coming next in React? And this, this is the this is the end. I promise. This is the end of the, the presentation. We're getting we're getting close. What are, where, where are we at? Uh, an hour and forty minutes in here, and we're getting close. Um, you know, I told uh, Emmanuel earlier. I was like, I don't have two hours worth of content. Who booked this thing for two hours? <laughs> but but we've been having some good discussions. So uh, so looking forward with. React. Um, hooks have paved the way for that thing called Fast Refresh, which you kind of saw a demo of, although that demo was cheating a little bit on the web piece. It wasn't completely Fast Refresh, but we're getting there. Um, the idea of Fast Refresh is that it, it, just like it can just swap out individual components on your page and keep state, um, and Hooks allows that to happen. It's essentially a reboot of hot reloading. So hot reloading has been around in the React ecosystem for a long time. It, it was always quirky. It never quite worked right. Um, the new Fast Refresh is a reboot of that that works incredibly well. So uh, that's exciting and new. Um, React has been completely rewritten as part of the React Fibers initiative, and so Fibers um, is the internal uh, uh, rendering uh, reconciliation piece, technically reconciliation, not rendering. And so um, without doing a deep dive into that, suffice it to say that previously rendering couldn't be paused. So you would get, um, uh, if you were doing a very expensive render, um, you would you'd kind of have this frozen user experience. And I'll actually show you a demo of that when I get to the next slide. So anyway, um, they rewrote React. Um, completely in the internals to this thing called React Fibers. It took them some time, like over a year. And yet, and the, and the amazing thing about this is they release it on a minor version. So they release it on React 16.6 or whatever, right? And um, and the whole world didn't even notice. Like, because the, the, the backwards compatibility was done so well that the engine could be swapped out without us ever even noticing. And we just kept going about our day, right? I mean, like while they were doing that, they deprecated a few things with some warnings. But like it still works. Like everything still works. And so that was maybe a testament to how, um, I guess, uh, uh, well React has, has and maybe that's, you know what, maybe it's because React is such, remember how I said like React doesn't give you much out of the box. It gives you just, it like just gives you this like little view piece and it doesn't worry about data fetching. It doesn't worry about all the other stuff that like Angular and other frameworks do uh, give you. Maybe because they have such a small surface area, such a small API, they can really nail the, this backwards compatibility in a, in a good way. So um, that was the rewrite. And why did they rewrite? Well, they, it, uh, they needed to unlock two important uh, future features. So concurrent mode is the big one. Concurrent mode is in, including the, the fibers rewrite three years in the making. And the idea of concurrent mode is to not block the UI under any circumstance. Um, like it needs to be fluid, even if there's an expensive render happening, uh, which I think I'm going to give you a demo of. Uh, do I have a demo for that? Where did I write the word demo? Here it is. Okay, cool. So, um, so uh, the the reason for the rewrite was to unlock concurrent mode, which is the the big piece to the future of React, and it is technically still experimental, and you have to opt in. So it's it is being used in production in certain cases. So, but you guys are um, unless you've explicitly you know about this and you've opted in, you're probably not running this um, concurrent mode. And uh, suspense is the other piece, which suspense. So concurrent mode is all about not lock, not blocking the user experience at all, and suspense is all about. Um, when the user has to wait for something. And anything that touches the outside world, data fetching and things like that, is like how to correctly, um, like what is the best way to manage that or abstract that so that we can wait, um, like so the user can wait for things without, um, like in a really smooth way. Okay, that brings us to the next slide, which is the concurrent mode. Oops. Um, and so to dive into concurrent mode a little bit, um, it is uh, a huge shift in the way React internals work, and that's where my demo comes. Um, and then it also gives us things like React Lazy for granular control over code splitting, which is, um, you know, again, out of the scope of this talk. But um, you know, when we think about what is coming down the pipe for React, it, uh, React Lazy allows you to say, okay, I'm, I'm only going to load, 
just the components necessary for this one page or this one screen. And then I'm going to, um, whenever I need something else, I'll just load it as I go. Um, and the bun and it integrates to the bundler and everything really well. Um, and it works with uh, the concept of suspense and concurrent mode. Um, I'm kind of glossing over that. So uh, let's look at it. L let me give you something concrete. So um, in typical blocking React fashion, um, so here we have, I don't know how many divs this is here. Uh, the little colored squares is each uh, a UI element, and there's a lot of them. And so um, as I type into this text box, um, every time I type a character, it's going to re-render all the colored squares. And it's probably going to do what you expect it to do. It's going to be laggy as I'm typing. So if I type in hello, uh, I typed in H. I've already finished typing the word, but I'm waiting for it to appear. And every time I type a character, it's re-rendering hundreds and hundreds or possibly thousands of divs there, right? So it is. Um, uh, so this is old blocking rendering, and the reason it is the way it is is because um, consistency, right? So you needed to do a complete flush to the browser of your entire view before you can move on to the next piece, because you can't have like part of the up page updated and another part not updated, because you would get into weird inconsistent states. So the initial thing of React was like, yeah, I have to render everything before we move on. Is this indicative of a real app? No, because I mean this is intentionally heavy. Um, as in, like in a real app, hopefully you're just not re-rendering thousands and thousands of things. Like hopefully thousands of things haven't moved around every time you press a key. But there are cases where um, things get slow. So um, this is blocking React, and then so here comes concurrent mode, which was like you know a year or more of development to go from here to. So this is blocking mode again. So exactly like it was before, um, and then over here on the right is. Uh, React with concurrent with the new fibers rewrite, which allows us to do concurrent mode. And here, you'll notice that every keystroke is not going to correspond with the render perfectly. The, it's, the render is going to happen whenever it feels like it, whenever it can, but the keystrokes will never be blocked. So is the UI still lagging behind the keystrokes at times? Sure, because the UI will update as fast as it can, as fast as your CPO will allow it to, but it'll never block your typing. And that is the key piece. All of the effort of React Fibers in concurrent mode was, was to lead to this. So um, your user interactions is never blocked. The rendering might lag behind, but it'll get there when it can. So I did not create this demo. I stole it from the internet. Uh, that is the future of React. Um, it will be the best thing about this, and this is kind of very re React kind of thing to do, is that um, you can flip a switch and turn on concurrent mode when it's ready, and then you'll get that performance boost out of the box, and you don't have to change your code. You need to need to write hooks, right? Um, I do not think it. Uh, you class components is fine with this. Yeah, so you don't need hooks for this. Um, hooks has um, hooks. Uh, so the previous thing we saw with fast refresh is dependent on hooks. This one is not dependent on hooks. I hope I didn't mislead you and say that hooks has. I mean. You definitely have to go uh, React 16 or whatever it is. Uh... Correct. Yeah. So you do have to go with a new version of React, whatever the version that has concurrent mode is. Uh, I forget, 16.8 um, or something. You do need that. Um, and you do need to make sure that you're not using a few deprecated methods that would break concurrent mode. So one of those is component will mount. Um, another is component will update or something. I forget. Wh whichever methods they deprecated, um, the reason they deprecated them was for was entirely for this concurrent mode. But if you're not using any of those, which hopefully you aren't, because if you have been using it, you've probably been getting those yellow warnings all the time from React for the last like year and a half. React's been like, stop using this. And we're like, why? It works fine. I'm not going to stop using it. And React is like, please stop using this. And so now uh, the reason it's been yelling at us with warnings you know, in dev mode for the last year and a half is because of this. So now they're hoping that the ecosystem has all moved away from component will mount and that we're ready for concurrent mode. Um, and then we can just flip a switch, and we're good to go. Uh, speaking of flipping a switch, that does not apply to React.lazy. That is a very user opt-in thing for, for a, a specific kind of code splitting. Um, but React.lazy is, is one thing that we get because of concurrent mode. Um, and then suspense is another thing that is not a magical flip a switch, and you get it. Suspense is something you have to opt into. But um, for in terms of concurrent mode for uh, this kind of concurrency that we just saw, this one right here, this you get by just kind of turning on. Um, if it, actually, if I look uh, what they turned on for this, uh, is there an index.js? Um, 
yeah, you just have to change this piece right here. So concurrent mode, you just have to do this create root thing. You have to do it once in one file and everything just works. It's kind of like weirdly simple. So concurrent mode, it's cool. It's the future of React and um, you know, maybe this is why React is still sort of innovating. It's, it's kind of crazy. We haven't, we haven't reached peak React yet. We're getting there. Um, so naturally, the next piece of this is, what is the future of React Native specifically? Not to be confused with Fiber, which is what we just saw. React Native Fabric is um, a rewrite or a re-architecture technically of React Native, not the not the piece that is covered by React, which we just saw about the concurrency and everything. It has nothing to do with that. This is about the way that the JavaScript thread in React Native speaks to the native side. Traditionally, it goes over this bridge, which had some latency issues. <clears throat> um, I don't want to say latency issues as in something that, um, that can't be overcome. Like We've been working around that for a long time, um, but there is better ways. And so uh, there is a real architecture of React Native coming down the pipe. Um, and then the, we, we talked a little bit earlier about the Hermes J JS engine. Um, that gives us really fast performance on low-powered devices. So that's kind of the future of React Native. Um, and again, both of these are internal things. Like I don't have to, I do have to opt into the Hermes JavaScript engine, but the re-architecture stuff, like I don't have to think about it as a developer. So this stuff is exciting. Um, why is React still innovative after all these years? I, I guess it's because they've been not afraid to really just revamp things, throw the book out, and just rewrite the book on you know, and, and they, it, there's only so many times your community will tolerate that. And so we, the community has accepted hooks re surprisingly well. Um, I don't know, like if React tomorrow comes out, I was like, we're going to redo everything again. Hooks is so, yeah, it's so 2019, uh, throw it all away and do it in this new way. The community probably won't tolerate that again back to back. But, um, you know, in five years, we've had one major shift in the way that we have to write React. Uh, and that was moving to hooks. And yeah, it, it seemed like a net win. Um, you know, I think Angular did the kind of major shift thing back in like 2016 and it worked less well, but you know, people complained and moaned and they were like, no, I don't want to migrate to Angular 2. And then eventually kind of, um, everybody sort of fell in line, I guess. Um, and Vue is now going through that. Vue.js, they're going through this like Vue version 3 and all the community was like, no way, I'm not going to do this new thing and I'm never going to accept it. I'm going to stay on Vue 2 forever. And, um, anyway, but you know. Uh, you, you do have to, I feel like in order to innovate, you do have to be unafraid to make some changes and, uh, you know, try to do the best you can with backwards compatibility. And then that would, that kind of allows you to still sort of innovate. So, uh, so five years later, I, you know, we're still getting new stuff with React. I still am excited to be a React developer and, um, and that's my talk. So thank you for listening.